Hello, and thank you for watching my Bat Mitzvah Devar Torah video. COVID means that I cannot have the Bat Mitzvah that I had imagined, but I am actually secretly happy to be able to give my Devar Torah in private and not to have to stand up in shul and speak in public. My Bat Mitzvah Sedra is Kitisa. The main event of the Parsha tells the sin of the building and worshipping of the golden calf by B'nai Yisrael, the children of Israel, and its aftermath. One of the outcomes of the sin of the golden calf is that God reminds Moshe of various commandments, including those of Shabbat, the Shalosh Regalim, the three festivals of Pesach, Sukkot, and Shavuot, and Kashrut. The Torah says in Shemot thirty-four twenty-six, Lot Tavashel Gedi Bachalev Imo, you shall not boil a kid in its mother's milk. In fact, this strange and rather gruesome phrase appears three times in the Torah, in Shemot twenty-three nineteen, Shemot thirty-four twenty-six, and Devarim fourteen twenty-one, and the Talmud, the Gemara in Chulin, on page one hundred fifteen B, learns three aspects of the laws of Kashrut from th- these three appearances. One, we must not cook dairy and meat together. Two, we must not eat dairy and meat together, and three. We must not have any benefit from the mixture of dairy and meat. For my Devarah today, I will look at whether the bans on cooking, eating, and benefiting from dairy and meat apply to laboratory-grown meat. I have studied this subject with my dad to try and understand if lab-grown meat would be considered meaty for kosher purposes. For example, could I have a lab-grown hamburger with cheese? Can I drink a milkshake after eating sausages made of lab-grown meat? And if I only ate meat that was lab-grown, would I still need to have two sets of plates, pots, and pans? But first, what is lab-grown meat? In 2013, when I was four years old, a team of scientists from Ma- Maastricht University in the Netherlands made the world's first hamburger made of cultured meat. That means meat that was grown in a laboratory and did not come from an animal. In the few years since, many companies around the world. Are working to create lab-grown meat in large quantities at low cost, so the lab-grown meat can be sold to the public. There are a number of advantages that lab-grown meat enjoys over traditional meat. These include: one, ethically, no animals need to suffer or die for us to eat lab-grown meat. Two, health, meat can be grown in the lab without additives or parasites found in farmed meat, and lab-grown meat has a far lower fat content than regular meat. Three. Environmentally, lab-grown meat would mean that less land is needed for farming animals. This would leave more room to grow things. It also means less less methane and other greenhouse gases from cows and other animals. Four, energy. On a weight-for-weight basis, lab-grown meat already only needs one third of the amount of energy needed to produce meat the traditional way. And five, efficiency. Only about eight percent of animal that is shechted, shechted is kosher. For lab-grown meat, up to a hundred percent of it is kosher. Now that we know what lab-grown meat is, is it kosher? Well, that depends on how we make the lab-grown meat. To be clear, I'm not talking about a plant-based meat substitute that might be made in a lab or a factory like corn. Instead, I'm talking about meat with the same cellular structure as traditional meat that has been grown in the lab. To grow meat in the lab, one, we start with stem cells from an animal. We'll discuss more about stem cells later. Two, we use the stem cells to grow muscle cells in a meaty soup of nutrients. And three, we then add add colorings and flavorings like beetroot to make the lab-grown meat look red and meaty. The question of flavoring food is an old one, and the kashrut issues are clear. Let's start with the stem cells. Stem cells are special cells produced by bone marrow. As sp- A bone marrow, a spongy tissue found in the center of some bones. They are really useful when we are trying to grow new products in the lab because they can be persuaded to grow into different types of cells. Stem cells can be taken from a dead bleh, or alive animals, and although the original process for growing meat in the lab used stem cells from a dead cow, it is now generally accepted among scientists working on lab-grown meat. That stem cells from a live animal are preferable to stem cells from a dead animal. So let's assume we are dealing with taking stem cells from a live animal. Taking stem cells from a live animal gives us a problem before we have started. 
One of the seven laws of Noah in Bereshit 9.4 is that we must not take meat from a live animal. This applies to all humans, not just Jews. This law is known as Eva Min Chachai, or the law of taking a limb from a live animal. Does taking stem cells break this law? Well, the Gemara in Chulin, again, on this, this time on page 102b, concludes that any meat taken from a live animal is not allowed. So, that seems to be that for us. But, what about my grandfather's favourite argument of Batul Bashishim? That is, if the non-kosher part of the mixture is less than one-sixtieth of the whole, we can ignore it and treat the whole as kosher. Well, that argument won't work for lab-grown meat in the same way it doesn't work for rennet and cheese. In Shulchan Aruch, in Eureidea, 8711, rules that any ingredient which establishes the form of the product is called a Deva Ama Amid and cannot be nullified. Just like rennet, which comes of the stomach of a lining of cows, in cheese, must be kosher, even though it's less than one sixtieth of my favourite, gouda. So, too, any stem cells in lab-grown meat must be kosher for the whole steak to be kosher. Luckily, there are two arguments that stem cells from live animals are halakhically okay. Firstly, there is a there is a concept that microscopic organisms, which cannot be seen by the naked eye, are not a worry from a kashrat view. This is the view of Rav Yechiel Epstein, who lived between 1829 to 1908 and was the rabbi of Novodok in Belarus. In his work of the Aruch HaShulchan, this is why most of us do not worry about microscopic organisms that live in the water we drink. Stem cells are too small to be seen without very powerful microscopes. So, according to this view, can be disregarded for kashrut purposes. Secondly, the stem cells themselves are not actually being eaten. Rav Zev Whitman, the senior rabbi for the Israeli deli company Tanuva, who make buddy chocolate milk in a bag, wrote in volume 36 of the Halahic journal Tachumin, that just as a plant which grows and develops from a seed in a new entity, compared to the seed, so too, any meat grown from stem cells is not the same as the stem cells. So, even if there was a concern of Avem in Hachai with the stem cells, it does not carry over to the meat itself. Now we have established that we can use stem cells to grow our meat. Do those stem cells need to come from a kosher animal? Can I grow kosher bacon in the lab? Well, here is, the good, here is where the good news for my dad stops. Although microscopic organisms are not an issue, as we have just seen, we cannot escape the idea of Deva Amat Amit. Think back to Renata, my lovely gavra. All the information my dad and I have been able to find on this, uh, this question agree that stem cells must come from animals which are themselves capable of being kosher in their own right. So, now we know that we can grow meat from the stem cells of kosher animals in the lab, let's try to answer our original question, is lab-grown meat parv? Well, yes and no. Most rabbis' work, who I have studied, agree that halakhically, lab-grown meat should be parv. This is because of various reasons, including 1. Lab-grown meat is a new entity, following the argument of Rav Whitman that we saw earlier. 2. We can follow the example of milk. Items which are derived from meat are not always meaty. And three, we can follow the example of gelatin. Items derived from an animal which are then truly inedible by chemical treatments are then processed to make them edible again are not meaty. But even if lab-grown meat isn't strictly meaty in theory, if the whole point of lab-grown meat is to make it as close as possible to real meat, in practice, how could we tell lab-grown meat and traditional meat apart? This problem led the leading authorities in the current debate about the halakhic status of lab-grown meat to rule that lab-grown meat must be considered meaty. These authorities include Rav J. David Bleich, the leading contemporary orthodox authority in this area, and Rabbi Daniel Nevins, the leading conservative authority on the subject. They argue... 1. Marat ha'ayin. Our actions might look suspicious to other people. And 2. The risk of confusion. 
For example, if you enjoy a lab-grown burger and want a second helping, there is a risk you could end up eating real meat as your seconds. But these arguments won't work in a world where you can eat both lab-grown meat and traditional meat. What about if we live somewhere where shahita is banned? Or if cows are no longer farmed? What if there is no more real meat? Well, it looks like there wouldn't be confusion about what type of meat we are eating. Then we could go back to the argument that lab-grown meat is part of. But that is a question for another day. Thank you for listening and helping me celebrate my bat mitzvah.